everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is a chat about demystifying the submission process. And we're just going to be chatting about, you know, agents putting their clients on submission to editors, um, our practice tips and tricks, you know, things that we do. There's no right or wrong answer to any of this. It's really just about what we do with our businesses and our authors and sharing the information here about how that can differ between agencies. Um, so with me today, I have Samantha Fabian from Root Literary, and I have Amy Bishop from, I'm always gonna say this wrong, Distill, Goderick, and Barrett. What? Is that right? Okay. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, and Lily Santiago is wonderfully going to be moderating for us. Um, so we, and I am Caitlin Johnson from Bell Castro Literary Agency. Um, we're gonna chat about questions that we already had prepared for everybody, and then we're gonna go through a few questions if we have time um, that we got from Twitter. So Lily, why don't we just go right ahead? Thank you. So thanks everyone so much for joining us while we do this little talk to demystify the submission process. It all started when Lily, as usual, was shouting out into the Twitter void. And I put this thread on Twitter that actually exploded and I realized how many authors were experiencing the same thing that I was. Sort of this loneliness, this isolation, and the mystery that surrounds the process of getting our novels sold to publishing houses. And I'm so grateful that the wonderful Caitlin, Samantha, and Amy are going to be here with us today to answer some questions that I've put together and some questions from you guys that we found on Twitter. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, I want to start with a very, very general overview, right? And so for anyone who doesn't know, what is the submission process? So um, submission for me is really getting my authors, you know, the manuscripts ready, the su supplemental materials are ready. I have a list of editors that I want to send out to and I'm going to pitch them the book. Um, and it'll depend, you know, on who we're sending it to, what the genre and all that is of what I'm sending. But it's basically just the, uh, the art of putting it out to editors. Yep, submission for me looks much the same. Um, you know, we've agreed on sort of a final manuscript or a final proposal if it's nonfiction. And um, I have my list of editors ready to go, you know, pulled from either personal, I guess these days, Zooms with editors, or just I know what they work on, and I think they might be a good fit, um, I, I, you know, other ways too. And um, we're all queued up and ready to go. Yeah, same thing. Um, I usually think of it as like an extension of the matchmaking process. like. Like me and my client found each other. So now we're trying to find that editor that like closes the loop and we're all just like perfectly happy working on this project. So yeah, similar, just getting that work from my clients that's finished and polished and out to editors and imprints. Mm -hmm. So as Samantha said, there is a lot of reflection in the finding an agent process and then finding an editor at a publishing house to buy your book once you've already signed with an agent. And so it is definitely like a cycle in a loop. And so I'm curious to know in the submission process, what is the role of the author and what is the role of the agent? I think for me, you know, I'm pretty quiet, like once we're on submission. And I think, you know, my authors, I'm, I tell them, please go find other projects to dig into while we're on submission. Um, you know, I'll be in touch with you if we have forward motion. So if you know, an editor wants to talk to you, if they're bringing it to ed board, like, you know, if we're moving forward along the way. In the meantime, if you want an update, you want feedback, you want to know who we're still out with, who's passed, always feel free to email me. I never tend to kind of just shoot out editor feedback or passes to them. I don't know what kind of day they're having, you know, it could be crushing to get a rejection or three, like, you know, within four hours or whatever. Um, but I'm like, if you ever want feedback, I will give you a list, I will give you feedback, like I will give you everything, but on your own terms kind of. So I'm often very quiet until we have some kind of um, like just yeah forward motion. But um, so the authors, I think just kind of, it's the waiting game, I think for all of us. Um, but I'm curious what Caitlin and Samantha have to say too. Oh. Uh, I don't know who wanted to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I really like Amy's um, method there. I, I kind of am a little bit of the opposite just because I send the feedback the day I get it basically. And I tell, when I offer to the authors in general, I tell them, you know, if you need something different, let me know, I'll cater to you. Um, but I usually let them know just because in my brain, I know I'm gonna forget if I don't do it right away because I have a hundred other things. Um, 
but for the author, Amy hit it on the head, is that when we're on submission, the author is working on the next thing. They're working on their next book. We have a discussion on, you know, what pitches do you have? What work in progress do you have? And they're working on that. They're writing it. They're editing it. Beta readers are looking at it. Normally, I also have my author kind of doing little Twitter social media things just because I like to see them engaging a little bit with the community. So like those little one line Wednesdays or the historical fiction chats. I'm like, go share a line of your book. Like, go go make friends. Go on. Um, or even if you don't want to share, just go and look at people's stuff and, you know, like and retweet and be part of it. Um, I think a lot of authors find beta readers and critique partners and kind of comrades that way because it's such a solitary thing. So I try to get my authors to do that. But during, yeah, the edit process, it's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of waiting and writing other stuff that isn't pertaining to this so that you can maybe forget about it for a little while. Caitlin, I love the idea of sending them off to do Twitter things like the One Line Wednesday. Like that's, I'm going to steal that. That's awesome. Do it. Yeah, I've never thought of the social media aspect, but that does sound like a really good point. Um, so yeah, Amy and Caitlin kind of touched on the big picture for me, actually. I'm like super like regimented. So like when I first go out with a project that week that I'm on submission, like I will give them an update the end of that week. So they know like how many people have it, how many people like haven't responded yet. And I let them know like how my practices go in terms of like nudges and whatnot. Um, we do have a conversation about them diving into the next project so that they can stay focused on it um, and feel a little bit distracted rather than like anxiously refreshing their inboxes. Um, and then I usually do monthly updates just so we can see multiple feedback side by side so we can decide like what's subjective and what's just like the work itself. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I, I usually cater it. Some people want responses a little bit sooner. As soon as they come in, some people are like, no, like I'm going through some stuff unless there's anything positive, like don't tell me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm usually really flexible to cater to each client, but like they will have to nudge me. So I know that they're not like a one month update person. So yeah, I'm really pretty flexible there. Kind of jumping off that too, I feel like I often will have like the call, like, I'm like we're ready to go on submission, like send me your final manuscript. And then we often will schedule a call to talk about like what this next leg looks like. Because I think if you give it to them all like in a big chunk at the beginning when you sign them, it's like, well, this is, uh, this is a lot of, you know, it's a lot of information. So I like to do it in like chunks. <laughs> like once you have interest, I'm like, this is what this might look like. We kind of game it out, but. Exactly. And like, as you reach each stage in the submission, like there's usually more information that needs to be passed along, like that phone call, like, hey, this is what's happening. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's a great way to go into our next question. So um, thus far, writers, everyone watching, we have you write a book. Great. You query, you sign with an agent. Wonderful. You work on that book with your agent and then you go on submission and then thus begins the waiting game where your agent waits for either a rejection or an offer, and you work on your next project and do all the wonderful Twitter things, which God knows I love Twitter. It's my favorite part of waiting. Um, and I think that's a really great way to, uh, great segue into this next question, which has to do with reading and understanding rejections. As Samantha said before, it's great when you look at them side by side to know what's subjective in a rejection and what isn't. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the language of those rejections and how authors can identify something as being, oh, that was just that one editor, or there's a significant problem with this manuscript, and also discussing why you're getting these, I love this book so much, but I have to reject it kind of rejections and discuss that nature because everyone knows there's a lot of nuances to that process and there's more to submission than just an editor loving a book. So I wanna open up the floor for you guys to discuss that. Yeah, I think I'm gonna jump on this one first. Um, part of the reason why I do like to wait for the one month mark is because then like the one month milestones is because then at least I have more than one like response at that point. So then I can kind of do that compare and contrast in language. Like if there's a consistent comment about pacing, then I know that that's something that we need to think about for maybe the next round. So we'll maybe see how this round goes. And then if we have to go to another round, we can really really examine um, the pacing. Um, there are going to be a lot of passes sometimes or like, I love this, but I just didn't connect. And those are always the hardest. Um, but I think it's relatable in the fact that every time you go to a bookstore, like you're not, there's books for every person, but not everyone's going to love a book the same way. 
So I always try to encourage that um, and explain that to my clients and say that it's not necessarily you. It's just that the person that you want on your team as an editor needs to be just as excited as I was and just as excited as you are. So even though it's a fortunate, like every no is one step closer to a yes. I think with, you know, initial submissions, like I, I do, I tend to do smaller rounds for, for fiction say. So I will often caution my authors, don't like read the first two to three responses, but take it with a grain of salt. We want a bigger kind of body of response. If you know, if we're, if all is going well, we're going to sell it on the first round. Um, so we don't even have to worry about them, but you know, I will often do like, when we finish a round, if we have to go to multiple, I'll, we'll have a call and I'll say, here's all the feedback you've gotten in one word document. You can kind of look at it all. Mm -hmm. and let's talk about the common threads that we're seeing. And like Samantha was saying, it is common threads. I mean, you might have someone saying, I love the voice. I hated the voice. And like, it's total, or the two editors have pointed out completely different things that they loved or hated. And the, the author's like, what do I do with it? Um, and I'm like, that's subjective, you know, like clearly that's not the main thing at you know, play here. But if we all get someone saying, yeah, this point of view is not working for me, the structure is not working for me, that's something that we want to pay attention to. And also just kind of to me at this point, I think with the, I loved it, but I just didn't, you know, we couldn't quite get there. It's a little bit like querying agents, right? Like we have, they have to fall in love with it, just like we had to fall in love with it. Um, I know I'm basically just saying what Samantha did, but um, I think that's a lot of the reasons I think they can personally love it and maybe not see a way forward with sales and marketing. Like they couldn't get their team behind it or they mm -hmm. loved it, but someone, you know, an editorial director thought it needed a little bit too much work to kind of move it to that next step. So um, I think they're, I always hope they're being genuine when they say it, I think they are, but um, they just can't for whatever reason quite get there. Yeah, the hard part is that a, a lot of the responses are going to be not for me, just not the right fit for my list, loved it, but I just can't move forward. Unfortunately, we get a lot of those, um, just like agents send a lot of them out to writers. Um, when I send my client the feedback, I usually tell them, this is the feedback, this is how I feel about it and why I feel this way. This is how I'm reading it and coming across it. Um, if you want to discuss it, let's discuss it and go through it and talk about what it means for you. And I'll point out if it's something we've been seeing a lot of, like somebody saying that the pacing is slow in this area and I just can't get past this point. I'm like, that's where we need to go back and revise. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, like Amy and Samantha said, if you're getting somebody who says the pacing is terrible here and then somebody else is like, the pacing looked so great. It was awesome. And I'm just like, that's subjective. <laughs> We've just got to kind of take that as it is and move on. There's not much you can do with that one. So it's definitely good to revisit kind of after every round, you know, are you getting the same kind of feedback? Are you getting different feedback? Is it all going to be basically not for me and it's not helpful? Because most, a lot of agents sometimes will try to poke them and be like, oh, that's great. It's not not for you, but you loved it. You know, is there anything more concrete you can give us? And sometimes they'll answer and sometimes they won't. So it's it's hard to get those, but it's definitely a thing where you, it's not about being thick skinned. It's about being kind of realistic skinned and mm -hmm. understanding that none of it's personal and that maybe it is just a reader reacting to it in a different way than another reader would. Like everybody yeah. before. Yeah, and like just jumping in, um, one thing we forgot to mention is that while an editor can love something, sometimes it doesn't ma make it past the other systems in place, mm -hmm. like sales and everything else. And so sometimes I'm like, I as an individual get to read something and love it and that's my choice and it's done with editors it's like we got to get everybody on the ship and that can be its own thing and like publishing is like wrangling cats so like if not everyone wants to get on the ship then you're like well okay thank you so much mm. yeah <laughs> so. i mean a lot of times it's like they're getting if they're more junior they might be getting second reads in house so you have other editors mm -hmm. and you get their level a little higher if that goes through they go to ed board and then you have all the higher ups and sales and marketing and publicity and maybe other people you know and then if they all sign off like it just it's a whole circus. <laughs> so and I, know, I know almost all the agents I know, they've lost deals because the editor absolutely loved it and the editorial board didn't want to do it or the sales team mm -hmm. said no, or it got through everybody. And then some CEO somewhere said no. We've all experienced that. So it's definitely hard getting feedback when you still don't know if like they loved it, if it's still going to go through. Okay. 
And yeah. I think the tough thing too is like when you, if an editor has a call with your author and like you're all hyped up after it, the author's really excited, the editor's really excited, and then they go to ed board and they can't get it through. Like that's, you know, that's like another tough, that's a moment where I say, here's the circuit. I kind of explain like, you know, mm -hmm. I prep them beforehand, but I might reiterate this is, this is sort of all the steps that are happening on the other end too. Um, so let's keep going onward. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful point to bring up just to remind everyone that just because an editor may love it, there's a whole chain of command behind that one editor. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of, that's the reason behind a lot of these rejections where it's like, I love this book so much, but I have to pass. It's not the author's fault. It has nothing to do with the novel. It's just, if you can't get past sales marketing, if you can't get past those higher up editors, that's where a novel dies. And I think that a lot of people don't really know that. They think, oh, an editor just has to love it and they have to offer. It's not the way it works and it's super discouraging and frustrating if you don't have that knowledge and, and understand that it's not like searching for an agent, right? Where if your agent wants you, they will sign you. It's not like that when you're going in-house, right? There's this whole chain of command that the novel has to go through. And like Caitlin said, if that one annoying CEO is in a bad mood that day and says, no, the book can die there, or you can get really lucky and everyone is on board. So I'm really, really glad that we had that conversation and it's perfect leeway for my next question. You guys are the best, making my job so easy. Um, you've received an offer. What happens now? So usually my, well, there's a lot of like screaming and then I usually call the author or I send a very urgent email like, call me right now. Oh. Um, <laughs> and then usually with those noises accompanying it. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, I'm like, guess I'll leave an offer. And, you know, I run through the offer with them and I say, I'll send them, you know, like the skeleton of terms so they can kind of look at what this, I'm someone who, if I hear something, I'm like, great. And then I forget it, you know, five minutes later, I need it written down for me. <laughs> um, and I feel like a lot of authors are also like that. Um, and then I go back and see who else still has it. And I nudge and say, hey, I have an offer. I need to hear from you. Um, and then we kind of see what happens if more offers materialize, then, you know, we are walking through those. Some editors might want to have a call with the author. The author might want to talk to the editors who are offering if there's multiple to get a sense, um, especially if they haven't corresponded before. Um, ultimately, if it's just like a one offer kind of situation at the end of everything, then um, we start negotiations. Yeah. I, there's definitely a lot of squealing when we first get the email. Um, I'm different. I actually don't call people. I really hate phones. I'll do it if I have to, but I have a Slack channel for almost all my clients. So mm -hmm. half the time I'll go and like direct message them and be like, guess what? And then I'll wait for them to answer and I won't say anything else. Um, and so I do that just because also time and I, I hate waiting. So I like to just kind of blurp it in there and they'll get the hint. But I don't usually give the deal memo, um, which is like the first email where they're like, we have an offer. Here's like our initial list of things we're offering. Um, I tell the, uh, the author, like we have an offer. I'm going to talk to them about this. And then when I've like notified all the other editors that have it, um, and I usually give them like the same with agent thing. I say like, we will hope to make a decision in two weeks. Can you, you know, get back to us by then? We really look forward to hearing from you. And like Amy said, you know, if you get other offers, that's when a whole other discussion um, starts happening. But if it's a one one offer deal, when we get to the end of it, I'll basically be like, okay, we have a deal memo. I'm looking through it. I'm gonna see what I can get them to change on, negotiate with them. And then when I think I've gotten to them to literally that best spot for you, where they're not gonna move anything, but we've maybe gotten them to fudge a little bit on some stuff, then I'm gonna come to you and be like, this is what they're offering what are your walkaways what are your do you like what do you, do you want me to push harder on any of these parts because we got them here um that's when i do that i like to show them the, the details of the offer once i've gotten it to kind of that really sweet spot um where i know that the editor is probably not going to be pledging too much more after that oh that's interesting sorry sam before i just want to jump in i we do i i like to also get just sort of their feedback on certain like sub rates too so that's like actually a really interesting I like that too. I often will go and get their feedback on like, do you want to push for territories? You know, would you take, would you gamble? Like, would you take a lower maybe advance for like, a, you know, if we can't improve the advance, would you take territories instead? You know, would you take, you don't care about territories, we just want as much money as we can get. Exactly, um, I definitely go back yeah. and ask them that when we yeah. get the offer. Like, so what are your like pressure points when, as I'm yeah. sure, start working on these people? 
And I do a deal memo at the end once we once we once we have closed, and that goes to like the editor, the author, and then like my team. Yeah. I'll okay. I feel like my style is a little bit of a hybrid. Um, also, like I feel like my systems are constantly changing and evolving, which is exciting. So I'm always looking for ways to make them better. Um, for now, like when I get an offer, I usually like forward it to my clients so they can kind of like see it, um, and then I jump on a call with them and like talk through what we have and I kind of let them know like this is just the starting point. Um, I'm gonna nudge the other editors that have it. So like this is where we're at. Um, but we're like hopefully we're gonna sell, we're gonna sell this book. Like this is this is done. We're just like starting at this point. Um, and then I do also kind of ask them like what's important to them. Is it more about finding like the perfect editor? Is there an imprint that they really are like sweet on or something like that just to see if that can affect the way things come to be. If we're in a multiple offer situation, again, I'm like hyper organized. So I make like grids so that they can like, I give them the logins so they can like see the Google sheet and like see all the information side by side because I'm very visual. Um, and so they can be like, oh, so this is like, so like one offers in blue, one offers in red, one offers in green. And they can be like, okay, I see where everything is different. Um, and then they can pop in whenever they feel like it, comment and ask me questions as they're looking at it. And then, yeah, I'm comparing um, the terms to like contracts that my team has done before. And I'm like, what can we get in these subways? I'm like, who got the best offer from this place? And just seeing where I can push and nudge and move things forward. Um, and then, yeah, there's always a conversation, at least for me um, with my clients about like how important money is. Is it more about the editor or is it about the money or is it about um, different elements of the deal? And then we proceed from there. But yeah, there's lots of screaming. I, we're usually squealing on the phone. That's my favorite part. So I'm like, your dreams are coming true. Like we did it, um, which is my favorite part. So <laughs> a lot of that. Samantha, just to pick up on your point about just like the editors, like, is it editors? Is it money? I know like I've had a couple of situations where they've had two, it's been like a house offer. So it's two different imprints of the same larger house that are offering like a, a matching offer. And, and that question has often been, what kind of house do you want to go? For example, the latest was like a more literary imprint versus a more book clubby imprint. And it was sort of like, mm -hmm. where do you think your book fits in better? And yeah. so, you know, because they, they announced the royalties, the territories were like identical. So it was really just a beauty contest kind of at that point, but also the imprints. One was more literary, one was more like upmarket book clubby. And it was like, how do you see your book? Um, yeah, it's so. really fascinating how much like the little details can add up. Like, oh, this one's saying lots of school and library things. And like this one that hasn't mentioned it. So like sometimes that can be really important. Like if your client, like works in schools or like really wants to see this in like a book like club or a book flair um that can really make a huge difference so i love doing those like little <laughs> things yeah, like, you think about putting it up front before you have to get them to say it it's cool to see yeah. what they've already focused on what they already have thought about for you yeah mm -hmm. so overview you've received an offer now you're going to compare those offers advanced territories that excels in the kind of editor that you will be working with, the kind of imprint, like Amy said, because that does make a, a huge difference depending on the kind of imprint that your book is going to be in. Um, and then you get the pleasure of accepting whatever offer comes your way. So you're scrolling through Twitter, you see all these, um, these are Publishers Weekly little clips, yeah. and you're trying to read the language and you're like, okay, what does auction mean? What does preempt mean? And what does exclusive submission mean? So yeah. can you break down the meaning behind this language? Oh, I'll take preempt because that's that's a nice and easy one. <laughs> so a preempt is usually when like you've probably just gone on submission with something pretty early in the submission process. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, but then an editor is like, I've read this whole thing. I am obsessed. Like this is what I'm willing to give you to take it off the table for anyone else. Um, and so they're at that point. Usually the preempt has an expiration date. So um, I feel like I usually have heard of like 24 hours. It might be different, but um, so they have an expiration date at which point you're on the phone with the client. You're like, hey, this is where we're at. Like you're looking at all the contracts. You're like, where, like looking at all the apples and oranges and seeing what makes sense. Um, and then you have like those hours to either decide if you want to accept the preempt or if you want to pass. Um, so yeah, basically preempt is, is exactly that. Um, basically it's like, what will you offer our client to take it away from all the other editors? 
Um, and usually that's a higher deal. Um, I can go through the literal like list of what those that terminology means for the deals the like actual terms we get. Um, so like nice deal is usually considered a dollar to $49,000. Um, that's considered a nice deal. That's what the advance is. Um, very nice deal is 50,000 to 99,000. Good deal is 100,000 to 250,000. Significant deal is a 251,000 to 499,000. And then major deal is 500,000 and up. You know, it's like the dream of the dreams. Um, yes. That's normally what the language is. And not some publishers don't put in what the deal was. Some people do. It all depends on who you're working with. And you can sometimes just ask the editor if they would mind putting that in. Because I know as an agent, I really like to have that in there so people know. <laughs> but um, that's kind of our tier system. I don't, I don't know where we came up with it and why we call it all that stuff, but that's mm -hmm. what we go by with publishers marketplace, especially. Yeah, so and there's part like of the understatement. <laughs> and, that, <nice> deal. <laughs> and there's like a weird like number. I forget what it is, but like one, there's like a gap in between. Like I think it's like good deal and significant deal. And I'm always like, what, what are we supposed to do if you're like right at that sweet spot? Like, what do you? And anyway. like, can we just make it up? Yeah, it was a fantastic deal. <laughs> Read that how you may. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and then I guess for, I think we mentioned auction was one of the words, I believe. Yeah, auction and exclusive submission. Yeah, so an auction scenario um, would be where you have multiple publishers, multiple imprints trying to um, buy the book. So usually... There are different ways to run an auction. I'm always fascinated when I see someone running an auction. Like, I will literally be like, tell me more. Um, so it, it can get really, so you can have an auction with as many as like two people, or I don't even know how many, like even larger than that. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so you get your offers in and everyone kind of eventually gets to the stage, which is like final bid. Uh, which is like the most you can offer and the best rights you, you can offer for that particular project. And then at that point, it's your client's decision which imprint and publisher they would like to go with um, if, from there. If you run a more formal auction too, I know there's like kind of like informal auctions and then like more formal ones. And like the informal ones, you might do like best bids, like Samantha was saying, or you might do rounds where everyone that goes in rounds. And I think often the more formal auction is like a time limit like everyone has to hear like everyone has a half hour to like go scramble around behind the scenes get back to me with their next improved offer and they go usually from lowest bidder to highest bidder and then just goes in rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds um and i feel like the ones that are timed are so stressful so <laughs> um, stressful. i'm just like for like everybody everyone is stressed <laughs> like yeah. it reminds me of ebay where yeah. it's just like people bid um and i feel like that one usually is when you have more yeah bidding. Like four um, or five or six yeah if you have like two or three it's usually going to be like a round robin scenario or just best bought offers so you just you have all of their initial offers you talk to the client and then get back to the editors and be like hey um we would love to hear what your best offer is like what what are you going to offer that is like end all be all kind of thing and we'll talk and then they'll send the new offers and then you talk to the client again and they'll be like which two maybe are the, the offers you're most leaning toward. And if they talk, they give me two, then I'll go back to them and be like, hey, I just wanted to let you know, um, we're giving you the opportunity to up your, your bid a little bit just because you are at the top of the client's list and mm -hmm. they look for you. And this is like the base amount right now where our offers are at. Um, so they can kind of decide if they want to add to that. Um, Cause I like to give that person, that person who's like number two, um, the opportunity to show how much they love it and how much they want to work with the author or and not necessarily when we talk about upping their bid or something it doesn't mean money it also yeah. means are they going to offer a bonus if you earn out within your first year um are they going to offer a bonus if you offer or if you sell a certain amount of copies of certain of like mm -hmm. by a certain time are they going to throw in like well we'll do like a book tour or something like that maybe in like a special way i don't know how we handle that right now because um, books are like, uh, but there's like other things they can offer to kind of sweeten the pot, or be like, we won't take translation. You take translation, and I'm like, you know, it's my favorite. <laughs> I know, I love it. It was so much fun. Um, I also feel like sometimes towards the end of like a really big formal auction, if like there's one my boss had done, 
pre-COVID, but it was, they got gotten, I think there's still with four people in and the offers are going up like incrementally. Like that was uh-huh. like, like $500 at a time, you know? And she was like, we're just gonna call best bids. Like this is excruciating. Cause they were like a time thing. And they were like, forget it. Like everyone yeah. at this point, everyone is giving me your best bid. And I know some of people were saying, you know, oh, we'll give you audio, like to Caitlin's point, we'll give you UK and translation, you know? And yeah, it's I just stress regardless. watching it. Yeah, it's stressful regardless but it's definitely something that the agent has to be, have their finger on the pulse for. Um, yeah, and I think we're we literally leading the charge on what this offer is gonna get. Yeah, and I think we didn't do exclusive yet, which- No, we didn't. No, we didn't do exclusive yet, last one. I mean, it's basically you bring, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but exclusive I feel like sometimes is a non-finished book too. Um, but it, it depends. But a lot of times I think it's really where you send it to an editor and they ask that they be allowed to consider it for a certain amount of time, just them. So it's not a preempt because they're not offering, but they are asking to see it before everybody else and have an amount of time within they may offer during that. So that other, mm-hmm. it's like a mix of preempt slash pitch. Is there also a scenario, and I, I am asking because I, I genuinely don't know, is there also a scenario where like you may just send to one editor exclusively and give them a head start? Is that also considered kind of an exclusive submission? I don't yeah. tend to do them, so I don't I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I rarely do exclusive. Yeah. I, I haven't done them before, but I've seen other people do them. And from what I my understanding was that the author um, wrote a project that was like specifically up this editor's alley and maybe like in the before times it had drinks and like we're like lightly pitching it and they were like oh my god that's like my cup of tea 100% like send it to me and so depending on the relationship between that editor and that agent they will send it to them and give them like maybe like a two week or a week um, exclusive so that they can read it and decide if they are going to come in with an offer um, but they do know that after that deadline expires, it could go wider. Um, and if they do respond within that window, then it's considered the exclusive because they were like, it was just like sh- tic-tac-toe straight down the line. Everyone was happy and it worked out. Exactly. Gotcha. So there's one last word I forgot. Um, and it means to sell on proposal. And correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, I think uh, it means the novel isn't complete yet. You're just selling like the general idea, the synopsis. That's the kind of thing that you would pitch to an editor. Uh, um, mm-hmm. and you guys can jump in if you want to correct me, but if not, we can move on to the next question. Um, I know Amy like does a lot of probably on proposal because of nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Nonfiction, you rarely yeah. have it finished. Um, it also, I think for fiction, it's rare debut will ever do this uh, because mm-hmm. you normally have a published title ahead of time, um, or it's a graphic novel, and obviously graphic novels don't have to be finished, just like nonfiction. But normally, it's going to be a non-debut author and half the time i feel like pitching on spec like that is depends on the relationship you have with that editor because if you've never taught like if an agent's never really had any relationship with that editor or talks or anything like that i don't know that i would feel comfortable doing it on spec just because (laughs) they don't know your author your the work they don't have that relationship so it may be a little too informal for them Mm -hmm. yeah I think usually this uh, proposal has like a sample chapter included too. Like it's like a very detailed outline and like a sample chapter. And for yeah. nonfiction, it's like a totally different, like that is sort of like, yeah, it's a whole different ball game, but you, you, you need a finished proposal of like an overview and like what the book is and why you're the person to write it. And like a marketing section and a competitive titles section um, mm-hmm. and a sample chapter and an author bio and um, what you're gonna do to you know promote it. Uh, Everything possible in the book. Yeah, basically. Yes. (laughs) Okay, so we have reached the end of the submission process, but sometimes we don't always get an offer, unfortunately. Sometimes we exhaust every avenue to get uh, get a manuscript sold, and it just doesn't. So in the event that that happens, what do you guys do next? That is where the author and the agent have a very good discussion. Um, so most of us believe in the nothing is like trash. Nothing is going in the garbage can. It's shelved. And basically that means once we feel we've exhausted a lot of our options, um, and we have a new, usually we have a new title up on bat because they've been working through all of this process. They've been writing their new book. 
So normally we have another one and we don't want to hold up their new title because this one's on submission mm -hmm. because it's hard to put two books if they're the same genre and age basically on submission at the same time because you don't want to be double dipping and like sending one editor two different works from you. That's a no-no. So mm -hmm. that discussion then happens with basically, look, we've exhausted most of the editors that I think would be great fits for this. The industry constantly changes and new editors come in. So I don't want to say we're not going to sell it and we're just going to push it aside and never look at it again. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to focus on your next work and put that one on submission and put this one on hold unless we get specific, like, I really love that plot. Can I come see it? Or can I come see it? Can I see it? <laughs> um, and or a new editor comes on the scene and we know it's like perfect for them. So we'll send it to them and not the other one. Um, those are the discussions that would then happen with me and my client. Um, and I usually don't shelve until, you know, we've done the big names, we've done the mid presses. We will discuss going to small presses and see if it's worth it for that client. Because again, small press is not always able to offer advances and stuff like that. So is it feasible for the author to even do something like that? Um, and so once we've gotten to that point, kind of, uh, is when I really start having the discussion with them of, okay, we need to talk about next steps, your next work, because your first book's not always the one you sell. And majority of all my clients didn't sell their first books, but they sold their second books. My process looks really similar. Um, I usually will send a big round of note. Um, you know, I think because we've been updating them going forward, they have a they have a sense like when we're getting close to the end. But to kind of close it out, I'll send them a big round of note being like, here's all the places that saw the book, here's all the feedback that we received, you know, just FYI, as you know, like not everyone offers a response when they pass. We just sort of assume sometimes if we haven't heard from them, despite nudging, they're not going to say anything. Um, and then it's sort of like, what do you want to do next? What are you working on? What do you? What have you? What have you been working on? Um, if they have multiple kind of things on the table, we talk about. Let me see a pitch for these. Let's talk about what might make the most sense to go out next. Um, and let's just put this one back in the door for a little bit. And as Caitlin said. You know, maybe we can revisit it down the line as the market changes again or more editors come in. Um, yeah. It's kind of in the back pocket. You know, it's mm -hmm. still there. We can still do it. You can still yeah. do something with it. Yeah. And just echoing Caitlin and Amy again. Um, for me, yeah, it's a really, I usually take like a really, like, like not intentional. I feel like all conversations are intentional, but it feels like when we kind of closed out on a submission, I want to like talk to my client and really assess how they feel. Um, cause obviously this is maybe the first time that they're doing this or like maybe it's the third time and they're feeling like discouraged or, um, exhausted. And then we kind of deconstruct that feeling. I'm like, is it because you feel like, you know, we're getting the same feedback and you don't know how to change. You don't know what to do with this project. And at that point, I, I really think it's because we've both been looking at it so closely and so intently that sometimes it does really need to sit on the shelf so that you can almost forget about the story and then reread it as a new reader so maybe you can revise a little bit better um and then yeah it's, it's really about switching gears to that next project and i'm always encouraging like i really don't believe a book dies i think like you can always come back to it and like throw sprinkle some things in there and everybody's like so excited about it um so yeah it's a lot of the communications a lot of switching gears um, but constantly just like reassuring my clients that like it, not every project is going to sell, but also like you're, as long as you're doing your best and we're doing everything to kind of position it in the best way possible, then, you know, it's, it's a positive, um, experience. And also, um, I keep like losing my train of thought, but, <laughs> um, it's a positive experience because you're learning and your craft is only getting better as you get this feedback and as you move forward. So, yeah. So my last question for you guys before we move on to Twitter questions <laughs> um, is red flags. What to ask agents when they are about to go on submission and practices they want to avoid? The first thing I always say is make sure you have a contract with your agent or agency because we've been hearing whispers. Um, really? Yeah, really? like people putting authors stuff on submission and they don't have a contract with that author there should always be a contract so you can know what they're do like what they are beholden to or what they're yeah. not beholden to uh, so yeah make sure there's an agent agency and author contract otherwise don't let them send your stuff out mm -hmm. protect yourself okay yeah for me i would say a red flag is like there's no question that your 
client can ask that like you either can't answer or like find the answer for. So if at any point like your agent's getting confrontational or like, no, oh, don't ask me that, like that's what is a little weird because like there are things that people just don't know. Like this industry can be so like insular that there's a lot of information that's not just like Googleable. Um, so I always am open to answering whatever question, even if it's the same question over and over, because I just want to make sure, like, you guys are storytellers. You will make a story up in your head if we don't give you the information. So I'm like, I will rather give you the information than let you just, like, make something up. <laughs> I love that. on Twitter for it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> or or you yeah, post on Twitter to force everybody to talk about it. Um, <laughs> definitely. I love that. Not no, you that and we'll make a story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would say just again, kind of jumping off Samantha's point, a big red flag is if the agent is PG or weird or defensive about a question they're asking. Um, it's not a transparent business, but I think our job is to make the process more transparent in the ways that we can. So authors should feel comfortable asking questions and they should be able to get answers about those questions. There might be some things that like an author say, oh, I heard X agency does this. Why don't you do this? And I might, you know, I might say, oh, we don't do it because X, Y, Z. But I'm still going to answer the question. I'm not going to mm -hmm. just say, oh, we just don't do that. You know, I'll explain it, and then you should have an explanation to your question, not just like a yes or no. You know, exactly. exactly. Um, and I think sometimes it's a red flag. This is something that I get a lot of questions on, but every agency does it differently. Is about sharing the sub list with your client. Mm -hmm. um, some people will make spreadsheets and show the editor name, the editor imprint, the date it was sent and all that kind of stuff. I personally send the name of the editor and the house slash imprint. I don't do spreadsheets or anything like that. And I don't share my spreadsheets because contact information is on there. And as much as I love my authors, you don't know who's going to get anxious and might use contact information. So we have to also protect the privacy of the editors. Some don't share the names of the editors because again, the privacy issue, people may call on Twitter, like Twitter stalk them, possibly contact them on Twitter, stuff like that. So sometimes they'll just share the house they're at or the imprint they're at. But at all times they should be willing to discuss with you about being on submission and like at least, you know, which house has had it, how long have they had it, have I checked in, have I chatted with them recently? They should be willing to talk to you about it. And when you're getting an offer of representation from an agent, ask them exactly how they handle submission like that. Do they share names with you? Do they not? Why is it they feel that way? Because they will, ex they should explain it out to you and let you know why their process is that way. Because like some may have had experiences with authors in the past that they no longer work with where say they shared the names of an editor and it went horribly. Um, there are definitely valid reasons for doing different ways of submission sharing. Yeah, like I'm very much someone who gives a like a like just the house name. I don't tend to give editor names. Um, if someone's really pushing, it's like okay, but like you have to be on your good behavior. Like none of this Twitter stuff. Like behave. Um, <laughs> but also, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, oh, that's me. It was, I know. I got like very hung up on the behave part. Um, <laughs> it's gone. It'll come back to me. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll ramble while it comes back to you. But yeah, I do similar for, there's yeah. some clients where like we get on the phone and I'm like, oh, did you remember? I did. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll tell them like the submission date. I'm like, it's going, I want to schedule this for X date, usually like a Tuesday mm -hmm. or Wednesday. So they know when like the date of submission. And sometimes they'll check in and be like, did you send it? I'm like, yeah, I sure did. But they know the date it's going out and then they can kind of go from there. Yeah. Carry yeah. on. <laughs> I, no, you're fine. I usually give like the week two. I usually am like, I'm going out this week. I'm thinking sometime in the middle of the week. Um, and then depending on the client, because like some of my clients, I know their personalities. Like I know who's the anxious one that's going to like go on. And I know the one who's like, I don't really care. So I'll usually pick and choose about the names and tell them like, oh, do you care? Do you have a preference? Um, cause there's also sometimes with like, if you nudge someone and they never answer, I go to a different editor and like, I'd rather not tell you the name cause then it's like, why did you go to Susie instead of Jan? Like, I don't want to have, <laughs> I don't think it's necessary, but, um, like we're still hitting the imprint. So, um, yeah. so sometimes that happens, but otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm always open to answer questions. Like I'm very vocal and I don't know the answer, but I will let you know when I find it. Um, mm -hmm. And so the red flag is when someone's just like, no, and will not give you any other explanation. Yeah. Or if they right. say, I don't know, and they're not going to do the digging. 
Right. They're just like, I don't know and I don't care to know. Like, That's our jobs though. Our jobs are to dig. No. Yeah. No, I think those were amazing points that you guys brought up, especially Caitlin discussing, you know, for people that don't yet have an agent and are shopping around for one, once you get those offers, don't forget to ask them how they conduct their submission process because every agent is different, right? Not all agents are going to share with you specific details, like how Amy will not share names to only do, you know, houses or like Samantha kind of just goes depending on her client's personality. Um, and I think that's really important to ask because some people will think, oh, if you're not sharing what you're doing in the submission process with me, you know, that's weird, that's wrong. When that's totally not the case, so everyone's, you know, process is different. And, you know, like Caitlin and Samantha and Amy said, if they're being, if an agent is being secretive, right, about that process or about anything and they don't want to answer your questions, that's a red flag, you know, and that typically means that they are probably, they don't know what they're doing or they're probably doing something they're not supposed to be doing, you know, yeah. behind the scenes, which is something you want to protect yourself with because, you know, this is your work and this is your career and it's really important that whomever is working with you, you can trust them and you can trust their professionalism and their process as an agent. Right. I also just wanted to jump in too and say sometimes because I'm so in the weeds and this is just like what we do every day, I sometimes forget that like authors might have these questions. So if, mm -hmm. if an agent isn't telling you upfront that like what they're doing, it's, it's not usually because they're trying to be shady. They might have just like been like, oh, like everyone, we're all on the same page. So like it definitely is worth asking the questions. They might not preemptively get around to it. Like, I try to remember to be like, I have to have a talk about submission so we know what to expect. I don't always hit that mark 100% of the time. So that's why it is good to ha be able to ask those questions. And then the red flag is like, are they being yeah. weird about it? Are they just not getting back to me? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why we always say, don't be scared to ask the questions. Like mm -hmm. have it on your list for when you get the offer, but also in the midst of working with that agent, don't be scared to ask. Because again, like, like Amy said, we get in the weeds sometimes, you know, we've got how many clients, we forget which one we had the sub talk with already. Um, <laughs> It's totally fine poking us and being like, hey, when you have a second, can we yeah. chat about this? Just to go over fine news and be like, yes, thank you. Let's yeah. get forward. Mm -hmm. It's usually, oh God, I'm so sorry. Yes, of course, when do you have time? <laughs> and it's we'll great growl. to also have- gravel. <laughs> it's great to also have author friends. Like if you guys, have any oh, yeah. writers out there have friends that are like already published, you can ask them and be like, hey, like what was your submission process like? That way you have like this prior knowledge and you will then know what to ask your agent, right? Because if you don't really know what something's about, how are you going to know to ask a question? So that was something that was um, that I find really valuable is having friends and author friends that are at different stages than you are because they're a great resource, you know? And Twitter, guys, Twitter is the place to make writer friends. You will find everyone there. <laughs> yeah, but also with the writer friends, don't compare yourselves to them. Everybody right. is different. That's, I just need to throw that in there because comparison is the thief of happiness. Yep, it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Don't compare your sales to somebody else's if they sold their debut and you haven't yet. Okay. Like eyes, eyes on your own page. Everyone is tailored a little bit differently. Um, you know, we're because you're not all the same, we're all gonna treat you a little bit differently in terms of submission strategy, in terms of, you know, what kind of leverage you come into a deal with, you know, like it's not because we love you any less. It's just the situation is different. You're a different person. We have to be flexible as agents. That's what we have to do. We have to be accommodating to all of our different clients as well. So be flexible with yourself. Understand you're not gonna be like selling things wham, bam, bam, or not selling things and then the person next to you is selling things wham, bam, bam. Just mm -hmm. breathe. Right. Which brings me to this amazing Twitter question. Someone would like, to, and this goes back to understanding that everyone's submission process is different and everyone sells at a different pace. Someone would like to know how long um, is a book on sub before it sells and how long will an agent wait before they decide to shelve a novel if it's not selling? Oh God, I've had books, I've had a book sell in like three weeks and I've had a, not even, maybe a little bit less than that. And I've had a book sell, it, it's been like like nine months maybe longer. Um, so it really can span, really can span. But then I think it's not so much how long as in terms of like who, before we shelve it, as in terms of like, is, are there places left to go? That makes sense for the book. Yeah. Um, so if that takes, you know, two rounds, like for example, I know science fiction and fantasy, there is like more limited houses to go to versus if you're doing like 
book club fiction, which in which case you could probably go to like 40 places and then still have like a few left. <laughs> Science fiction fantasy, you might tap out m way sooner than that. So um, it kind of depends just like who's left. Especially if it's adult or YA. Like yeah. adult sci fi yeah. fantasy, whew, that list is short. It's narrow. Um, <laughs> YA, not so much. Um, it also depends on if you are again just shelving and not push it, like still pitching it every now and then. I know, so I know, I, I, not me personally, but I know an agent who actually sold the book finally three years later because they were still every now and then when they met an editor, they'd talk about it and they found that editor. They found it. Um, so it depends. I will say, like, for me, I know we were, we were wanting to talk about this at one point. Like, my rounds are usually five to 10 editors per round. And, like, if I get a pass, then I replace that editor. So it's like a revolving door. So I don't usually have a, number or a length of time, I will withdraw something if I have not gotten anything back from this person in like 10 to 12 months, because then I'm just like, no, we can send it to somebody else. Um, but it, it's it's really what Amy says, is you literally have exhausted your avenues because again, we can't send to multiple editors at one imprint. You can't do that. You can only send to maybe one and maybe share it. They, they share it with somebody or you can ask them, like, do you mind if I send it to your coworker? There's some loopholes here and there, but if you send to one editor at an imprint, you can't send to another editor on their same team. You just can't do that. So you, you exhaust your, your options, which is why it's mo so important. Your agent is looking for the best fits mm -hmm. um, and not just mass sending it out. Mm -hmm. I do want to ask, cause that brought up a good point. Um, curating a submission list, which is another question here. Um, someone would like to know how agents curate their submission list for novel. And I would also like to add the caveat um, for authors of color. Sometimes we uh, that process is different because if you're submitting a book by an author of color, you wanna make sure that you submit it to like agent, excuse me, you wanna make sure you're submitting it to editors that are looking for like POC stories that are like black or Latinx or native or Middle Eastern. So. Um, how do you guys curate a submission list and how does it differ when you're doing it for an author of color who has a story about a character of color? Yeah, so for me, um, the way that I curate my list is usually the preliminary draft is usually like me meeting people um, and getting a sense of like what they're looking for, like what things they're sick of, what things they get, like get them really excited and they're constantly on the hunt for. Um, so I usually like list everybody and then I start to weed it out by people that I'm like, oh, when we spoke, they said this extra thing that's like included in this manuscript. Um, usually when I'm dealing with um, like my BIPOC clients, we have a lot of conversations about what matters to them in terms of the editor that they wanna work with. Um, and so we're constantly having a dialogue about why I think this person would be a good fit. And I'm trying to do my best to curate a list of people who would be interested in the project, but also respect the message of it who have worked on projects that are similarly placed. And I know that based on the reputation, based on what my colleagues have told me that they can do um, right by this client and this project. Exactly. Um, I think that's ex exactly for BIPOC clients. They're, the discussion will always happen, I feel like, because we know the doors that have been slammed and the, the gate posts that have been moved. Um, and a lot of times I'll talk to clients and be like, um, would you like to like first rounds and stuff like that, that we focus only on BIPOC editors because they're the ones who can possibly relate more to these themes, relate to these experiences, um, can understand the writer's momentum and purpose behind things that we start in that direction instead of, you know, mixing it up or just going for people who are looking for these stories. Um, and for submission, we have, it's, it's a process putting a submission list together. We've got manuscript wish list. I go through the publisher's marketplace deals for that genre back for a year, basically. Um, I check all the editors who've bought in that genre in the past year, and then I go looking for them personally. We do phone calls. Back in the days pre-COVID, we would have lunch and or coffee and stuff. Um, so much um, happening. Um, to, yeah, I miss those days. Not that I really get to do them in Florida. I, mostly I'm on phone calls and Zooms anyway. But it's it's a lot of deciding who's that best fit and who's looking for exactly what's on there. And if you don't know, you set up a meeting so you find out. Mm -hmm. Usually when I'm doing a submission list, um, as my author's like revising, I usually do a round of edits before we, you know, all that. 
Um, while they're working on that, I'm taking meetings. I mean, at this point, it's Zooms and phone calls, unfortunately. I miss the coffees and the lunches and the drinks, but oh well. Um, and during those you know, calls and Zooms, I'm finding out what they're looking for. I'm telling them what I'm doing. And then I also will pitch select projects that I think might, might, might be a good fit for them. And if they want to see them, then I add those to the submission list. Our agency also does a newsletter of like forthcoming projects that we're excited about. So mm -hmm. editors can request from that. Um, and then it's we have a database as well. We use Atlas um, and it has like editor interests from like, because there's a team of 15 of us here, we all kind of share information. So all of the, cause you know, there's, you know, we all are hitting different kinds of editors um, in terms of experience and, you know, age and genre. So I often will go trawling through Atlas to sort of find out who might be the best fit. I, can't, I will look at Publishers Marketplace, um, especially if we're on like a third round and I'm like, I don't know any more names. Um, like, who has done similar? Stuff? Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a myriad of ways. And then I think for BIPOC clients, um, I do probably cast a little bit of a wider net, but I think I'm more involved in bringing the um, clients in on the submission list. I think a lot of times my BIPOC clients tend to be pretty active on Twitter already. So they might have already seen editors who are that they're interested in working with or houses that they're specifically interested in working with, they might come to me with names. Um, a few of them have come through Pitch Wars or Rev Pit, you know, or other kind of things like that where editors have reached out to them personally. Um, and I think like if I'm looking at um, a more broad kind of submission list that's not just BIPOC editors, I'm looking at white editors who have shown a commitment to publishing voices of color on their list who aren't just like looking for it, but then have not actually produced. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my my targeting. And it's, it's always a conversation. Like, it's always like, what are your concerns? You know, what do you think about these houses? How do you feel about them? Um, what questions do you have? Yeah, and I know that's a Twitter question too, is if the, the writer gets input and like they totally do. If I, I can't look at every single manuscript wish list post an editor puts up. I'm not gonna catch them all. And I'm not gonna read every book in existence. So I have my clients definitely tell me, hey, I saw this person post this the other day. I think this would be a great person to send and I'll put them on the list and I'll go research them. And if I choose not to use them, I'll tell the author why. I'll go back mm -hmm. and be like, well, they just bought this book that's almost very close to yours. So they're probably not gonna do it because it'll compete. Um, but that's like key. It's, it's, it's an agent doing that with their client because otherwise I may never have sent one of my clients to William Morrow and it was her dream publisher because of her history with her grandpa and she's now being published by William Moore. So it's definitely a missed opportunity if somebody's not doing that with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I forgot to mention that like the database of like agent like info with like editor wish list because we do have like there's like nine people on our team. So like different people take different meetings and we all kind of like combine that info. And honestly that's part of what drew me to working at Root was because they were working in the genres that I wanted to be in. So I knew that they had pre-established relationships that I could tap into um, to build out my network further. So yeah, I love team stuff like that. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think the agent networking has gotten so much bigger as Samantha and Amy both know, like part of agent groups now. Um, and we all share, like anytime I get manuscript wish lists from editors, I share them on my like group chat and be like, hey, if anyone has something for this editor, here's what they're looking for. Um, yeah. It's become a lot more of let's get these books sold and not I'm keeping this information to myself so I can make sales and no one else can. Um, we share so much now and I love that. And so now I literally have like so many files at this point of manuscript wish lists and stuff that other agents have shared with me um, that have gotten us submissions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I love that we have broadened so much like that and it, it does help build your submission list too you can only yeah. research so many people mm -hmm. yeah. speaking of submission someone would like to know why there are different times of the year you don't and do god submission and when those times are i kind of do a rolling like like i will submit between like the week between christmas and things and um christmas and New Year's because we all have are like laying on our beds like gorged with Christmas food and not really looking at email. Um, it's like the week we get off, and often I'll, I'll stay away a little bit from like the last week of August because I think a lot of folks go away that that week. Um, it's not a big deal; like they'll see it when they get back. But why? Why? Um, and 
I would say like after Thanksgiving, I probably taper down a little bit. Like I might send out a couple things, like if like they're resends or like a second or third round or something, but I'm not maybe sending out like the debut that I'm really excited about, like right after Thanksgiving. But other than that, it's sort of like. Yeah, like I don't think there is a hard and fast don't send during this. It's the same yeah. with agents. I'm like, there's not a hard and fast don't send to me as an agent. Um, I think after, uh, like after Thanksgiving, um, like Amy said, is when I do notice things slow down in the industry because we are gearing up to hopefully clean house before the new year. Um, so you may not be getting a lot of, it may be very quiet on the editor front during that time at, or the agent front, um, or you're getting a lot of really fast passes and I don't like those. Um, so I may, you know, slow it down around then. And I do try to every now and then keep an eye out if it's a, like a cultural holiday or something like that. Um, but I don't think there's really a hard and fast rule for don't send right now because you'll be like blacklisted or it's a yeah. bad, bad thing. Mm -hmm. Not a hard and fast for me, but like I am super mindful of like, like I don't know, for summer things slow down like significantly. Like I, that doesn't stop me from going on sub, but like if there's something I'm like, oh, I really want to like hold on to, that might be a conversation that me and my client have if I'm like, this might be a good time thing to hold on to for however long when like people are actively like, we need to fill this part of our list and like we have these gaps. Um, but yeah, so there's no really hard and fast rules. And also like depending on your project, if it's evergreen, you can really just like submit it whenever. Um, if you're looking for like a specific holiday pinpoint, then that might affect your submission a little bit. Yeah, like if it's Christmas themed, I'm gonna wanna maybe pitch it at the beginning of the year just because if they want it to go in production and be out by Christmas, there's a lot that goes into that. So, or it'll be like summer of the year before you're actually planning to get it out or something. Um, but, and it could come down to editors too. If I know it's a slow period at the moment and there's an editor who I know is a slow reader, I might wait on that imprint because I want to send to that editor, but I know this is the time of year where they're not going to be getting through their list fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we have just a little bit of time left, by the way. You know, we have so much Just stuff. one last question, because this is a really good one, and then we can wrap this up. Um, someone would like to know if authors are able to give suggestions or ideas on who they'd like to submit to or what imprints those might be, and if agents are willing to create new relationships with authors um, if they are interested in those certain people or imprints. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Always. Um, sure. I'll tell them if I think it's not a match, like, um, I sent, like, I sent this to an, um, an editor the other day and they got back and said, oh, I'm not taking middle grade anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll tell them if I, I think that person's not the greatest, like, match for them, but definitely. And if, if it's somebody I don't know enough about, or I can't find things online and stuff, I'll set up a call with them to chat with them and pitch the book to them that way, just in case. Yeah. I think all agents are open. I would hope all agents are open. So. We like, like our job people. Yeah, yeah, our job is meeting new people. And like, if someone's not willing to take that, like initial, like most of us are like introverts, but for some reason in this job, like we can just put it on and like reach out to whoever. And that's what I do. Same. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for answering all of these questions. It was wonderful to get to speak with you guys this afternoon and get to discuss the submission process and hopefully give everyone out there watching some really, really needed advice. Because heaven knows this industry can be super difficult to navigate, especially if you're just starting out. So I thank Caitlin for so graciously arranging this and Amy and Samantha for their wonderful um, contribution. And thank you guys for having me. It was wonderful getting to speak with you guys thank, thank you Lily. thanks so much this is a great opportunity for writers to learn things and if we didn't get to a question you wanted or uh you posted a question on twitter and we missed it put it in the comments below and we will go ahead and or at least i will um because it's on my spellcaster page i'll go through and answer those questions about the submission process for you but thank you everybody who is you know attending and thanks so much for being part of this with us Thanks, guys. Bye.